Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Kia ora. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about art, about your art. Conventionally, people come up here and they talk about themselves. I want to talk about you and your art and why it's important to us here now. And what exactly is art? Imagine this in your mind as I tell the story. It's 13,000 years ago. We are beside the banks of a river in what is now southern Europe. A cave person is hiding in the banks of the river, watching as two reindeer swim across. The water is high. It's flooding early autumn rains, melting the glaciers, the ice are carrying down. The reindeer swim in a wide circle across the swollen river. They're sunken right into the water. Just their noses are out above the water, breathing the air as they swim. The male is tucked in behind the female, close, swimming across the water. They get to the other side. They climb out. They shake themselves and head off south on their yearly migration. The artist turns and walks back to the cave. And over the next few weeks, he or she, we don't know which, carves an image of what he saw that day. And here it is. The swimming reindeer of Montresouk, where it was found in southern France. It is an amazing replication of an exact, precise image of what she saw. The female at, at the front, you can see the stripes on the side of her body indicating the early heavy coat coming on for, in preparation for winter. The reindeer back, the male at the behind with the antlers pushed down into his back as he swims to keep his nose up. Perfectly recorded. Now remember, we've got cameras, we've got notebooks, we can record what we see, but this artist, she didn't. This was done from memory, and most of that creature was under the water. Why? Why was this done? Scientists reckon that over, probably around about 60,000 years ago, the first humans arrived in Europe. About 45,000 years ago, an ice age started. And about the same time, art started to appear. It's as if art was a way of fighting back against this survival threat which was gripping the people of the time. Art was a way in which they came together. It was a glue which bound them together, gave them a sense of focus, sense of culture of who they were, so they could help them survive through this ice age, through this bad time. Art is vital to culture, and we have done it ever since. These are the Chauvet cave paintings done 40,000 years ago, 14,000 years before that carving. Scientists have tried to explain why these artworks were done. Of course, we'll never know. There have been various theories, and they've been generally discredited. The most recent one is that they were done by a shaman under a trance state, probably with drugs. Well, I'm sorry. That belittles the art. Artists do art because they feel something. They don't need drugs. And I think there's a far better explanation of that. It was given by Clayton Eshelman in his book, Juniper Fuse, where he described these as postcards of nostalgia. They are the way in which these people of the time are trying to reconnect to nature around them. But why animals? Here's another story. I like to hike. I travel a lot, and when I travel, I go hiking in wild places. And recently, I was in Utah. I was on my own, alone, and I was off trail, hiking in the forest, and I stopped for the night, and I camped in a small clearing. And I just had my meal, and I was sitting there, leaning against a tree, reading. And suddenly, there was this incredible crashing all around me as the, in the dry bush, and all the hackles on the back of my neck went up, and the surge of adrenaline went down my spine. And there, standing just a few meters away from me, was a deer, a mule deer with big, round ears, pointed, motionless, cups pointing at me, and these amazing, beautiful eyes staring at me. We had this eye contact for what seemed like ages. Nothing else existed during that time. And then slowly, with high-stepping movement, she turned around and walked out of the clearing, stopped, turned back, looked at me, and finally left. 
These are some mule deer, not those ones which I photographed in Colorado. In that moment, I sensed an incredible sense of empathy with that creature. Now, I don't have a very good memory, but I remember exactly what she looked like. And I think that's how those artists were able to recreate those images, because of the intensity of the moment and the empathy which we were feeling with that creature at that moment. Animals today, we see uh, they're walking hamburgers, they're captives in zoo, or they're fawning pets. We very, very rarely have that equal connection with animals in the wild. And I think, I really believe that these cave artists of the time were sensing something in these creatures which they knew they had lost. Humans had consciousness, awareness, we had thoughts, we had gained the ability to communicate in that way at a price. We'd lost a sense of connection with the environment which we saw these animals had, we felt it, and through the art, they were trying to recreate that. I think that's why they were doing animals, and that's possibly how they were able to recreate these amazing images. And as I said, we've done it ever since. Humans have two brains. No, that's not quite right. We have one brain in two hemispheres, the left and the right. And there's an amazing book by Ian McGilchrist called The Master and His Emissary, in which he describes how these two brains work, these two hemispheres. You can see here the different characteristics of those two hemispheres. <clears throat> the right is outward-looking, connected, and the left is inward-looking and isolated. Spherical, linear. Intuitive, rational. In context, decontextualized. Empathy is in the right, the left is self-referential. The right likes uncertainty, the left does not. And these two parts of our brain have evolved to work in tandem in a three-part process. Imagine one of our early ancestors, an ape on the savannah way back in Africa, grazing for food. He was sort of connected with the environment through the right hemisphere through that sense of empathy with the surroundings. A threat appears on the periphery of his vision. He homes in on that threat, takes what it, he sees out, passes it over to the left hemisphere, out of context, it analyzes it rationally, hands it back to the right, puts it in context, says, yes, this is a threat, but not at this distance, watch carefully. So we have this three-part process, right, left, right, in which our brains have evolved to work. And animals and creatures all have that same process. It's not like one side is better than the other. They are both equally important as part of one process. McGilchrist goes on to describe throughout our culture how there have been these cycles in which our culture has been influenced first by one, then by the other hemisphere. The early Greeks, the flowering of the arts was the right hemisphere. The late Greeks was rational, logical, left. The Renaissance was a period of the flowering of the arts again followed by the Age of Reason, the Age of Enlightenment, which was rational. The Age of Reason was personified by Descartes, who gave us the Cartesian grid. He said, I think, therefore I am. Followed by the Age of Reason, we had the Romantics, the period of Beethoven, of Wordsworth, of a connection with the landscape, of paintings which the figures were, the human element is, is diminutive, it's small compared to the power of nature, the size of the trees, the size of the clouds of the sky, you're drawn into that sense of nature where the humans are small. And then the final triumph of the left hemisphere, the Industrial Revolution and modernism, and back to the city grids from, that started with Descartes. Now, I believe that a lot of the problems that were encountering today in our world are because of this imbalance, because we've become so dominated by the left hemisphere, the rational thinking side. We've lost connection, we've lost feeling, we've got empathy, we've lost intuition, because the left hemisphere thinks it knows all the answers. It doesn't need to deal with the right anymore. But the left hemisphere is a self-referential hall of mirrors. It is not connected. It doesn't understand consequence, it doesn't feel a consequence. Now, I've talked a lot about art, um, and I, in my life I've done art, and I've been called a designer and a craftsman. So what are these words and what do they mean? I don't believe that they are separate 
things or people, I believe that they are processes, they are verbs. And crucially, they are part of one creative process, which we all engage in. And we have to do it through all those different stages. The art process is the generative part, the intuitive part, where we connect, where we, we, we understand our place in the world, where we generate our vision, our vocabulary with which to describe that vision. The design process is then how we put that vision together. It's a rational thinking process where we compose the elements we've generated in our creative stage into a structure. And then, as a craftsperson, we make it. Described here by Michelangelo, the perfect combination of all three. He was an artist in the way in which he told our stories, in a relevant way to our culture. He changed the culture, the way we think about ourselves and our stories. As a designer, he then put that vocabulary of his bodies, of his figures, into this incredibly powerful com um, composition. Um, the fingers almost touching, the power of that composition expressed exactly what he's trying to say. And then he was a consummate craftsman because he mixed up his own pigments and he prepared the grounds in such a way that those beautiful colors have remained ever since. Now, I had this eureka moment not so long ago, and I suddenly realized, and you've probably got it already, obviously, that those three parts of the creative process are exactly the same as those three parts our brain goes through, right, left, right. The right hemisphere is the art process, the generative, intuitive, feeling part. The left hemisphere does the design part, the rational, logical, disconnected, leaning forward, concentrating part. And the craft process is embedded, intuitive, haptic knowledge in our bodies with, with which we express the work. The problem with today, I think, with the designers in our left hemisphere-dominated world is that designers think, oh, I'm not an artist, I didn't do that art stuff. Well, if you don't, what do you design with? What is your voice? What is your vision? What is your vocabulary? What have you got to say? You have no connection through the right hemisphere, so you use what's around you. You see other people's vocabulary and forms, and you shuffle them in some witty, derivative way, which looks new for a moment. But there is nothing really novel, there's nothing strong of you in that. And then if you don't know how to make something, I don't believe you can design it either. So because the left knows nothing new, it only gets its sense of newness from its connection to the right. If you're only designing with the left, you will never do anything generally new or original. I've expressed this a little bit in some of my work. This is the three baskets of knowledge. It tells the Maori story after the creation of how Tani was given knowledge by the gods and taken, took it down to earth and gave it to the humans, the knowledge we need to live on earth. And these three baskets, <clears throat> on the right, Keti Aranui, our knowledge of the natural world, the forests, the oceans, our bodies, the food we eat, made with wood. In the middle, Keti to Aori, our rational knowledge we have in our minds, crystalline, jagged, made out of aluminium. And the left, Keti to Atia, our knowledge of the spiritual world, nebulous, translucent, polycarbonate. And the moral I took out of this is that for us to live harmoniously on this world, those three need to be in balance, and they're not. The one in the middle, Keti to Aori, is drowning out a connection to the natural world and to the spiritual world. And again, this is why we have problems through this imbalance. Now, I started here talking to you, making you generate images in your mind through your right hemisphere. I gave you a rational, logical explanation of what's happening over there through your left hemisphere. Now here, back in the right, we put it into context. We are in a new ice age. Not a climatic one, obviously. We're in the cold, icy grip of globalization, of big business, of mega corporations, the oil companies, the banks, <clears throat> the pharmaceutical companies, agribusiness. They're so big and so powerful, they can rule governments. They have no care for us in our communities or ourselves. If they want to leave tomorrow, they'll drop us just like that. We have all sorts of problems in our world of pollution, of climate change, of exploitations of people, yet this juggernaut shows no signs of tackling any of those problems. It's pushing on regardless. It knows nothing else. In the 
left brain dominated world of their boardrooms, it all makes perfect sense, perfect rational sense. The bottom line, the dollar, <clears throat> profit. That's what matters. Disconnected from their right brain, from the consequences of their action, they do not see the suffering they're causing. They don't see the destruction they're wrecking on the planet. I, I believe that we need to try and swing our culture back into one of those cycles towards the right. We have to bring out our connection to nature and make that more important within our culture. We have to move back towards using our right hemispheres much more. We have to be like the cave people who observe nature, sitting by the river, watching the deer, or whatever the relevant equivalent of our time now. We have to observe nature, realize it's important, try and reconnect with it, and through our art, tell those stories into our culture to make our culture more and more aware and responsible of nature. Nature is important because in nature we have fresh water, our clean air, and our food. And if we lose that, we are stuffed. So we must value nature, and we must reconnect to nature through our art. There is also a new kind of art arising. It's not object art quite in the same way. You don't have to be able to draw, but you do have to care. This is the Tempelhof field in Berlin, which used to be the airport where the Nazis built their Stuka dive bombers and launched them on Europe. Today, it is a park where people come together, they grow their own vegetables in these amazing allotments, they create artworks, they have events, they have a socialized time together. Artists around the world are doing these sort of things. They're planting vacant lots in cities with wildflower as an act of activism. Now, I've shown you how you can use your right brain in different ways to reconnect and express. It's up to you how you do it. But you can, because it's so important that we have that connection, we value nature, and we use our right hemispheres more. You can do it. We can do it. We must. Kia ora.